to 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 either end anyway Next so uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, it is my great no it is my pleasure that's the correct way to formulate it it is my pleasure to uh welcome our speaker of the day Bernhard Pfarringer does not need anything much in terms of introduction concerning his his contributions and he and his achievements to the field of machine learning um there are standard textbooks and uh, uh, standard pieces of software that bespeak the quality and the impact of his contributions with very recent updates um Bernard Pfarringer was an esteemed colleague here at OFI in uh, the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, he then went to uh, take his next steps in his uh, uh, career in, uh, in New Zealand. He will be talking about this in a much more competent fashion than I could. Uh, let me just add. Uh, his current positions, as far as I know, uh, as professor and uh, until very recently dean uh, of the University of Waikato, and then also a co-director of a recently established AI lab. Um, and again, uh, uh, bespeaking uh, the professionalism and also the scope of his of his contributions to uh, not just the scientific community, uh, he has been uh, also putting an emphasis on the impacts of uh, uh, machine learning in particular, and I think it's safe to say AI in a broader sense to society. But without any further ado, it's I, I, uh, I would like to ask Bernhard to take the floor and please start with your presentation. Thank you very much, Paolo. This is a great introduction. Um, I will just start sharing my screen. Can you allow me sharing the screen? Because right now it's disabled. Okay, and you also muted, Paolo, so we can't hear what you're trying to say. <laughs> so it should work now. Let me try again. Yes, it works. That's perfect. And I'll bring up some slides here. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, yes. Okay, that's great. Then I'll also put that away. Cool. Okay, so thank you very much for coming to this talk. Um, going to talk a little bit about um, some interesting aspects of machine learning that I think sometimes are being ignored. And so here's a quick overview. So I'm going to first of all do a little introduction in addition to what Paolo already said so that those who don't know me get a better idea of myself and also maybe those who know me but have forgotten some things might have a little reminder. Then I'm going to talk about uh, data streams and uh, a specific system called MOA and some general problems, also opportunities, and the future. But let's start with introduction. So here in New Zealand, I would usually introduce myself in the way that you do it with um, the indigenous people of New Zealand, the Maori. So there's a kind of a setup that you talk about where you're from in terms of the area and stuff. And so the first thing would be, you would say, uh, which means uh, these mountains in the back, the North Cat, that are my mountains. This is where I'm from. And this is probably an appropriate picture right now. Time of year. But as Paul already said, like 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, I made this decision to move down here to the end of the world. <laughs> and this is what it looks like here. So we have mountains here as well. And in winter, they would have some snow on the top. And actually, the highest mountain in New Zealand is almost as high as the highest mountain in Austria. Um, all the Lord of the Rings fans of among you will probably know this. So this is kind of close to the university. It's less than hours drive away and you can still visit there. 
Um, just to give you an idea, so this is New Zealand. Well, the most important islands, the North and the South Island, there's a few small ones as well. And we are not exactly in the center of the North Island, but kind of. And the other interesting thing here is what you see is we're landlocked. So this is the largest landlocked city in New Zealand. So maybe it wasn't a good choice in terms of being closer to the beach. But at least it only takes me an hour to drive to the west or to the east to get to the beach on the weekend. Um, the university is a bit, little bit smaller than the University of Vienna. So there's only about 500 academic staff and about 10,000 students. And like 20%, one fifth are general international students, even though right now this number is a little bit down because of COVID, but we really hopeful that it will improve again next year. Um, we were, we started in 1964. I might also maybe make this here, put that away. And um, yeah. We have a nice campus at the outskirts of the city, but it's a small city, it's like 150,000 people. So it's not a big issue that's on the outskirts. And actually I live reasonably close by. So usually I just walk to work, it takes me about 15 minutes. Just good morning exercise. Um, yeah, I've been here for a long time and I've done this little word cloud and that actually shows what you hope to see. So it says learn, machine learning, data mining and lots of smaller stuff. So, if you just want to get an idea in terms of machine learning of what I am or what I do is I'm definitely more of an experimental machine learner. And we don't have the distinction in machine learning these days between, like if you look at physics, there's a clear distinction between uh, theory and experimental physics. And that's fine, everyone accepts it. In machine learning is not that much of an accepted distinction. Sometimes you run a little bit of an issue as an experimental machine learner when people expect you to do a lot of theory as well, which we do to some degree, or we bring in some people who are strong theoreticians, but it's definitely not my main focus. It's really more like um, actually doing things, building, measuring, evaluating systems, trying to get better understanding of how things actually work by measuring lots of things and then trying to improve existing algorithms or coming up with new ones. And so usually I have a number, good number of students, research students to look after every year. So these are some estimates, which might actually be spot on this year. And we're lucky in the sense that if you think about the funding landscape, New Zealand is an even smaller country than Austria and I remember, and it's probably not changed much, that funding is not easy to get by in Austria, even so, at least you have the European Union funding, because small countries don't have a large industry, and so you really rely on the government. And so we've been quite lucky over the years, and the latest thing is this TIO project, which is actually really cool because it's for seven years, so it started two years ago and will run for another five years, which really gives us some uh, like really nice secure setup in terms of being able to employ postdocs and more PhD students. And I generally teach two different machine learning courses, one more introductory and one on deep learning these days in the last few years, and I hope that will continue in the next few years. Okay, now data streams. Why are they important? What are they? And what's uh, tricky with them? So first of all, I just want to convince you with this slightly outdated slide, which I have to apologize for, uh, that basically you're surrounded by data streams. Because the thing that has happened in this century is that everything went digital. With the invention of the internet, basically you have a huge digital footprint and whatever you do, you generate data. And um, there's a lot of things that even if they were originally not digital, have been digitized over the years, or are still being kind of turned into digital data. So it's a bit like a second renaissance, if you don't mind me saying that. So it, when you can see it all around yourself, like whatever you do, um, there's something uh, watching over you if you want, or you actively generating data. And, and I have a couple of more examples because with the Internet of Things, 
which yeah, is a big hype and it takes a lot longer than everyone thought. But the same is true for autonomous driving, for instance, but it will be there eventually. And what we do see is like we have these smart meters and I'm not sure if that is in every household in Austria, it's definitely in every household in New Zealand has been for a number of years now. And unfortunately right now it's not being used much except for billing. But uh, you could do a lot more with all the data. And we've had some experimental projects on that. So basically just a fine-grained prediction of local energy consumption and together with um, the move to completely renewable energy, it will be really important to get on top of that. Or just uh, automation that you may have at home. Um, I think that's something that's a bit more popular in the US than in Europe or in other parts of the world, but it is coming. Or <laughs> if you look at traffic, um, here in Hamilton, we basically have these little parking sensors in the city, every parking spot now. And of course the malls have that as well. And so that's, in the mall is quite useful because they can actually guide you to open spaces, which is really cool. Another thing that you may not have seen before or may not be aware of, which I found um, interesting, in multiple ways is that, I'm not sure if you ever thought about that, but if you have a reasonably modern car, you have a Bluetooth radio and that Bluetooth can talk to other Bluetooth devices. So cities actually just put little devices onto like the uh, traffic light poles. And then you sit there in the car with waiting for the light to turn green. And meanwhile, your radio talks to this little thing. And because your radio is identifiable, they know that that radio was there at that point in time. And then you go, I don't know, 500 meters, a kilometer to the next traffic light. And then the next traffic light talks to your radio. And so then um, they know that your car has been there at this point in time. So you can actually follow cars or view how they kind of drive through the city that way. Of course, um, at that level, it's still anonymous. This is just a ID, a unique ID, but if you can kind of connect it ID to the actual car, which may be possible if there maybe is a camera and some license plate reader or something like that, you can actually really do good surveillance. But right now, at least in Hamilton, this is not being used for surveillance, it's really being used to study how cars typically go through the city and then optimizing traffic around that. Um, all kinds of industrial things, I'll skip over that. That's more like New Zealand. <laughs> I'm actually not sure how clearly you can see there's a color around this cow. So dairy industry, agriculture in general is really important in New Zealand. New Zealand generates about uh, an amount of food that would be, could feed about 40 million people, but we only have 4.5. So you can see that's a huge export factor. Now these colors on those cows are amazing because first of all, they're really useful sensors so they have step counters in there. So you know how much your car is active. They actually have a GPS in there, GPS receiver, so that they know exactly where the cow is. Then they measure things like the temperature of the cow so that you know whether there's some issues with health or more important, the cows, dairy cows. You wanna know if they're in heat or not. So whether it's time for artificial insemination, which is kind of fun in New Zealand because when I came here, Lots of local people knew about AI in a different way because for them, AI was short for artificial insemination, what every farmer does here. <laughs> but these uh, colors actually go further. So they are also uh, Wi Fi equipped. And then the farmer can actually uh, quote talk to the cow. Well, it's actually not the farmer, it's usually a program. Um, there's a little uh, vibrating thing in there. And also, and you may not agree with that, a little electric shocking device. <laughs> so basically the cows are trained to kind of pick up on the vibration and then don't go further in the direction they're just moving. And this way you don't even have to have a fence. You basically do virtual geofencing. And when the cow goes too close to the border, then the thing starts vibrating, telling the cow, well, turn around, don't go there. <laughs> so. This is um, being developed right now. This is not something that uh, is um, really on the shelf product, but and some there's some skepticism around it in terms of the price because there's a lot of cows and these things are not cheap. So it's the question is, is it worth it? But we'll see. 
Okay, so now you should believe me that there's a lot of data streams around. And what's the problem with them? Well, the problem with them is that things always change. Nothing stays the same. Maybe the laws of physics, but that is maybe just an exception in a way. Um, but this is the problem with machine learning, that in machine learning, we usually assume that everything stays the same. So in a slightly more technical way, we usually assume that our data is IID or independently sampled and identically sampled and comes from the same distribution. So we have some data, which is a sample of the distribution. We train our classifier with that. And then we apply the data to make predictions on new data with the assumption that this newer test data comes from the same distribution and is also sampled the same way. That simplifies a lot of things. And that has led to really good successes, but it's just problematic in the sense that it's not really true. And if you actually look at data, you'll find immediately that there's a lot of things that you're aware of why that is not true. Like there's, of course, a trends or seasonality, things appear or disappear over time because there's always some developments and there can be gradual and catastrophic change. Sorry, that's a word that I always struggle with. Um, now, if you know that sometimes things go bad and then machine learning gets some um, really bad press and AI in general. So I have this kind of interesting example. <laughs> Unfortunately, I apologize for the quality of this picture. It's the best one I was able to find. Um, now there's a little bit of a story behind this. So what you see here is a billboard that is used to name and shame people who, or basically commit little traffic offenses. And that's all some city in China. Um, what they have is they have pedestrian crossings and cameras to pick up on faces. And then when you cross the street, when your light is red, basically they take a picture of you, they identify your face, they send you a little fine in the mail, but when I say the mail is WeChat or something like that, but uh, they also then put that up on a big billboard so that uh, everyone knows you're the baddie. Now, unfortunately, they got that wrong because apparently this uh, woman here is the CEO of a very large company in China. And what happened was, and that's really hard to see here because of the quality of this image. Um, she's the CEO and her face was used for advertisements on the bus. And so her face is on the bus, like here maybe. And the bus was crossing here. And so of course the bus had green light, but for the camera that picks up on the pedestrians, that looked like a person crossing here while they had red light. And so completely uh, going wrong. And the, nice. that was actually happening like, um, four years ago already. Okay, another thing where just to show you an example of seasonality and maybe add a little bit of something you may not be aware of, definitely was a surprise to me. Um, on the x-axis here, we have time of the day. And uh, I would have to double check that, but that might be actually GMT. And what you see is activity on Twitter in terms of we measure how many tweets are being sent that use different languages. And the green line is English. The so English is usually on top, but this time here where there is this red line, the red line is Japanese. So I didn't know that, and I'm not sure if you did. Um, Twitter is apparently very popular in Japan and it's like the second most popular language. And because Japan is very concentrated, most Japanese speakers really do live in Japan. They're not distributed across the world we get this peak for peak activity because peak activity on Twitter is usually evening times for most people. And then you also see other languages that kind of have varying patterns during the day. But I also wanted to show, or maybe you should have a lot of things where humans are involved. We see interesting peaks like uh, a morning and an evening peak, which makes sense if you think about the daily routine that most people follow. Not everyone, but on average you see um, peaks in energy consumption in the morning and the evening, peaks in traffic in the morning and the evening, but also differences between work days and weekends where you some of those peaks will completely go away. So 
not, there's a distinct pattern. It's not that it would be close to a global average. But on the other hand, if you look at the short period of time, like if you go from here to here, this is flat or here, it's not flat, but it's a, it's a straight line. So you can approximate short intervals by constant or linear behavior. Uh, yeah, this is just another uh, summary that might be of interest to some of you, where you see that the actual genuine number of tweets generated in English is the same as in Japanese, but there's a lot more English users. The number of retweets is a lot larger for the English ones than the Japanese ones. And the number of replies is about the same, interesting enough. And also what might be of interest is that Japanese is an outlier in the sense that there's more genuine tweets than retweets. Usually you see a lot more retweets than what you see in terms of genuine tweets from the language. And of course, if you still don't believe that things change, you just need to look at what COVID has done to everything, including machine learning models, where with all the lockdowns and changes we had in behavior and forced changes and voluntary changes, um, our traffic patterns have completely changed, uh, like air traffic in a way on, like New Zealand, it's an interesting example because it's an island. So most people use a plane to get to New Zealand or out of New Zealand. And definitely through at least the first few months in 2020, air traffic almost came to a complete standstill. And now we see that it's kind of slowly ramping up again. So here in New Zealand for this Christmas season, it's the first time now that some of the airlines are coming back like Canadian or United Airlines or Hawaiian Airlines. They suddenly start flying to New Zealand again. So if all that is true, machine learning actually shouldn't work, right? <laughs> but still, even standard machine learning works pretty well. And then raises the question, why? How can that be? And the one uh, reason for that is that, of course, some um, you can get around some of those issues reasonably simply by being smart, mainly being smart in terms of how you represent your problem. So an easy thing is to look at changing representation from values to the absolute to relative values. So instead of having absolute values, you look at differences or you look at the fractions or multiples, uh, percent degrees or degrees. Like if you look at, any kind of stock market prediction. Stocks today are a lot more expensive than they were 20 years ago, but the daily changes in terms of percentage up or down is always the same. Usually it's like in the 1% area or less, and then suddenly sometimes there are these um, big crashes or other things happening where it might be a little bit larger. But even then, um, there's a limit to that. And, can only go so far. And so what really is happening for most places that use machine learning in production is that they basically retrain the models on a very regular basis. Because for a short enough period of time, we don't necessarily have to see change. It might look static. It's like with similar and massively complex functions. If we look closely enough, unless there's some interesting functions like fractals, then um, they would be very uh, simple and flat or at least straight lines. And now when you do retraining, of course, question is how often do you do that? And usually this is on a regular basis. So for instance, um, we were talking to a company that does fraud detection for online gaming. And they basically found that they have to do it every single night to be up to date. Then there are things that don't change that much or that quickly. So for instance, um, I'm sure you have the same in Europe. Uh, we have two or three online services now that give you an estimate of a house, of the price of a house or the value of a house in real time. Well, you can go there right now and find out how much your house is worth on paper. And what they do is, of course, they get all the information from the sales that are happening and then update some models that they have. 
And right now, most of them do once a month retraining. Some of them have switched actually to every single week because uh, it's a little bit better in terms of capturing short-term trends. But it's also an interesting uh, problem that I might mention later again. Or if you have some way of measuring how good or bad your performance is directly, then whenever you notice that, well, your model is actually going down, that it's uh, getting its prediction uh, wrong more and more, then you might do retraining on demand. So for instance, um, if you look at um, how ads are placed on web pages, if you find that those ads are never being clicked by your users, then there's something that you need to do about it. So here's just an example that Facebook has published about their retraining regime. So they have all these different services and you see that um, some things are retrained daily. Some things have an other interesting schedule, like um, if you have a lot of your photos or images that you take on Facebook, then basically there's a counter there. And after every end photos, they do a little bit of uh, retraining of a model. Some things change very, very slowly. So multi-monthly retraining is sufficient. And some are weekly, some are sub-daily. There's often there's a, a relationship to um, how long does it take to retrain? If it takes a lot of resources, I'm not able to do it that often. So the photo one, every end photos, is really fast, so it doesn't matter if you do that very often. But um, like language bit here takes days, and so doing it every week might just be stretching it. You might just finish it in time for the next week when you restart the next training. So this raises all these issues. Um, it may not be fast enough. Um, you have to decide how much data or what data you're actually going to use. And it might actually, because of that, then take a lot of energy. And so far, machine learning hasn't gotten a lot of bad press in terms of energy, even though it maybe it should. Usually it's Bitcoin and other crypto mining that is um, proof of work based and therefore takes a lot of energy that gets the bad press. But uh, some of the large language models that we are using now that have been trained for months also take a lot of energy to be trained. Yeah. and. Um, <laughs> For some businesses, local businesses, it might be possible to train overnight. But um, if you're kind of distributed around the world, there is no nighttime, even though there might be different uh, hotspots. So even Facebook basically say that um, some of the stuff can be done easily overnight when it's night in those places where Facebook is not available or not popular, like in the Chinese time zones, for instance. Okay, so something that um, has been around for a while and that caught my attention and then some other colleagues here and students and stuff is uh, a subfield of machine learning that's called streamlining that actually tries to address these problems in a more direct way by really accepting that's the fact and trying to directly address it. And so streamlining, in my opinion, can be viewed as an intersection of a lot of different incremental approaches in machine learning, but also lots of ideas from time series research and some interesting ideas from databases as well. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a very extreme setup where we assume that we have these data streams that are coming in and it can be readings from a sensor or there can be tweets that we randomly sample or anything. But there's an example coming in at a point in time and then we have a little bit of time to do something with that and the next example is coming in and we have to switch to that and so on and so forth. So we want to have algorithms that are fully incremental and therefore also can only use limited amount of memory and time for every single example. But also we want them to be anytime algorithms in the sense that we can also predict for data that comes in at any time. It's not that we want to have a distinct uh, training set, training phase. We train a model and maybe do a lot of optimization and try to make it as good as possible. And then we deploy the model. We want to have something which is 
a model that at the same time can be updated, but also always being used for predictions as well. And we accept the fact that things change, so we want to be able to adapt to those changes. And the last bit is kind of uh, where a lot of the current research uh, focuses, uh, which is the fact that the actual feedback, the training labels, in a lot of the research that we currently perform, we're a bit naive and assume that we get instantaneous feedback, which is only true in a very limited number of environments, but generally there's either a delay at least a delay, or we may not be able to get feedback on old examples anyway, for various reasons. So one consequence of all these five challenges is that basically everything will be an approximation, but often there are algorithms that actually can give you bounds on how good or bad your approximation is. Another indication of a field that's getting reasonably mature is that the textbooks, I've only put two there, I know there's more now, um, this is basically the one that I think more or less started in terms of textbooks. It's getting a little bit outdated now. It's more than 10 years old. Uh, Joao Gama from the University of Porto in Portugal has written that it was very good to start with. Um, and then you may recognize a name here. Um, four years ago, we published this book here because when teaching streamlining to students, we were using this book originally, but then it really got a little bit outdated. So we thought, oh, well, let's do our own. And that's getting outdated now as well. <laughs> so we might have to do a second edition, maybe soon. But uh, as I said, there's some other books out there. I haven't put them there because to be honest, I haven't had time to read any of those. So I'm not sure if they're any good or not. So I was reluctant to put them there. So, but uh, you do your own research. Another indication is, is the software available. And this actually shows that it is mainly still research work because everything here is research software. Down here, there's something which is interesting. So Amazon, you know, all the big uh, vendors like uh, Google and uh, whoever, Microsoft, they have the in the cloud machine learning offerings these days. And Amazon has something which is called SageMaker. And that's different from all the others because they also claim, and I'm not sure if that's 100% true or not, because again, I don't have much experience with the system yet, something for us to look at, but they claim to also take change and stream seriously and really support stream processing of machine learning. Um, up here, this is also maybe an indication of maturing. So Spark streaming is now a mainstream thing in the Spark environment. For a long time, there were some streaming efforts around Spark that were in the various incubator stages, but now this is official thing and large companies are starting to use that for not machine learning purposes, but just for processing streaming data. And it's an interesting indication. And um, I'll skip the rest here in the interest of time. So this is our own system that we started quite a while ago. So officially it was released. The first official release was made at the end of Richard Kirkby's PhD, so in 2007. So it's already 15 years, it's been a while. <laughs> this is a Java-based open source software system that's similar to the one we have for regular machine learning, similar to WCAG, can actually still interoperate. It's like, I think we even share some of the source code still. Um, it kind of started with Richard, and then it was picked up by Albert Buffett, who for a while used to be a postdoc with us. And this was actually when he also spent a lot of time in making that thing really robust and usable. And then had an interesting career going to various uh, companies. Uh, some of them don't really exist anymore. And then he came back to us here about three years ago, take up a position as a so-called entrepreneurial professor, which was a New Zealand initiative where they wanted to uh, make us um, be more engaged with industry. and. We do that to some degree, but as I said at the start, there's not that much industry to engage with in the first place. So more is Java-based, and that's good for us, but uh, maybe not so good in terms of general popularity. 
because these days it's really Python that everyone uses for machine learning. And so we also have a system that originally was called scikit multiflow. And then after that, it was merged with another system that has similar ideas. And the outcome of the merge is now called the river. So it's kind of, yeah, you can imagine streams turn into rivers, something like that. Um, nice thing about Python is the Python almost looks like pseudocode. And so what I've done here is just to give you an idea of how things look like, I've stolen this little description from the river web page because it's kind of the standard or the, a typical workflow with dreams. So you would import a couple of libraries that you need. And then in a very Python or scikit learn like style, you would set up your model as a pipeline. In this case, you do some scaling and then you just imply a simple logistic regression model. Of course, all of that has to be incremental. And then also we want to measure something, in this case, accuracy. And then here, well, here's a for loop which uh, across this data set, which looks like um, variable simple data set, but basically in Python, there could be a generator that just gives you a pair of X and Y, your example and the actual label infinitely often in theory. And so you just look at one example at a time. And first you predict for this example, and assuming that you already you also know, so this is a setup for like writing papers. It's not the real world because in the real world, you wouldn't know the why at this point, because if you wouldn't know the why, there was no point in predicting it. But in this setup here, we predict and we compare it to the actual ground truth and update our metric estimates. And after that, we use that example to actually improve our model by learn on one example here. And here, if we assume that we stopped it at some stage, then at the end, we can look up what was the final accuracy. So here, the total will be close to 90%, which is not that bad, but probably can be improved. Now, the thing about um, full and immediate feedback, knowing about what we wanted to predict immediately afterwards, is, of course, not very realistic. But whenever you are working on data streams that are really automatically generated and you just want to predict what's happening next there, like um, electricity consumption I was mentioning before with the smart meters, or something where we've done a little bit of work on is, um, you may have seen rain radar images, and you may actually use them yourself. But uh, these days, lots of web pages, I think in every Western country, you can find a web page that gives you the current rain radar image and maybe a little bit of a history of the last few uh, hours or maybe even the last day. And um, you can take those images and input them to learning programs to predict what would the rain radar image look like an hour down the track so that you get a prediction of what will the rain look like an hour in, in an hour's time. That might help you make decisions like, um, I don't know, I'll reschedule my outdoor meeting or something like that. Um, so what it means is if I collect those images, put them into my prediction machine and get a prediction for what the image should look like an hour into the future, if I then wait for an hour, I get the next image. So I can compare my prediction with the ground truth. So here the delay would be exactly one hour. Or when I try to predict the half hourly electricity consumption, after half an hour, I know what the real consumption was. And so this delay is also interesting because um, it kind of tells you how fast you have to be with your prediction for them to make sense. Because if it takes too long, then there's no point. You might just measure the new actual value. Now, sometimes you may have problems that are just too long and too unclear and where you might get around the problem by changing what you actually predict. So instead of for a bank predicting whether someone will default on the mortgage or not, which can take a long time because mortgages can run for a long time, it might be a lot easier to actually make short-term predictions like will they default within the next six months? 
And then you have a fixed delay now. So I can predict that and after six months, I get feedback. I can see how many of my predictions I got wrong and how many I got right. And then maybe update my models accordingly. Or, and that's a very uh, kind of uh, thing happening right now with IoT and all these sensor developments. Maybe we can add new and different sensors to make things more feasible. So for instance, with a battery, um, say, say a car battery, like for electric vehicles or something like that, but even for regular cars, they have a lifetime and you might want to be able to know how long the battery will last. And you have an average for a lot of batteries and how that was achieved, well, we don't know, but um, if we can actually equip our batteries with sensors and get regular readings, and if you look at, for instance, Tesla cars, they basically do a lot of regular readings and they all go back to the factory. So Tesla has a huge database with a lot of information about how their cars are being used in practice. And that includes the state of the battery, the kind of charging cycles, the health and whatever. And then you can see how much uh, like fast charging degrades batteries faster and stuff like that. So this is of course outside what you as a machine learner can do, but talking to a company, you can convince them that it might be a good idea to add a cheap sensor to make lots of things a lot simpler. Whenever you need human feedback, it looks very different. It's a little bit of a harder bit of the story because for instance, if you look at um, sentiment prediction for tweets on Twitter, um, at the end of the day, you probably need a human to actually judge what the sentiment was of a tweet. And so this is gonna be expensive and slow. You will never get explicit labeling of all the millions of tweets that are being generated every minute. So again, maybe the sensor idea can be reused. So if you would call indications in the tweet like emoticons or the retweet count as a like virtual sensor, if you want, then you can take advantage of that. Or generally what we need to do is we need to look at some form of active learning. Well, basically you have a budget, you're being told you can label, I don't know, a thousand tweets every day. Now you better be careful in selecting useful, a very useful subset of all the tweets that you get the right 1000 to label that give you good information for everything. Okay, now I just wanna look very quickly, just checking the time. Okay, maybe I speed up a little bit. Um, in terms of um, how do we make things incremental? Well, it turns out that a lot of machine learning algorithms are kind of incremental already or can be run in incremental ways anyway. So the simplest example that you may remember is Naive Base, where basically you just have counts for attribute value pairs and for how they relate to the class different class values. So you basically just have big tables with counts. Of course, for prediction in turn of the probabilities and generally with the batch learning, we set up the tables with computer probabilities and then when we do predict, we have some very quick like table access and a little bit of multiplication. Uh, doing that incremental is very easy. You basically just only update the counts while you go. And every time you need a prediction, you do this tr uh, transformation to probabilities on the fly with the current counts. It's very straightforward. Uh, logistic regression that was mentioned before is a bit more tricky because the good algorithms are all batch algorithms and they're not easily made into incremental. But um, what we can do is we can pretend that this is like the most trivial neural network that you can think of. And so we can use any form of stochastic gradient descent to have uh, updates for every single example and keep in line. Decision trees might look a little bit more tricky, but they too can easily be used in such a scenario. Uh, what you need to do is you need to somehow throw it three step by step. So you start with a Single, single node, the root. And whenever an example comes in, you have some data structure that keeps, uh, again, like knife base, in a knife base way, count of statistics. And whenever you have enough statistics in the node, you can then decide to split that node into two new nodes. And 
The interesting thing is the statistics that you need to keep for being able to split is really more or less the same that you need for knife base. So what you can now do without any extra cost is in every leaf, you can have this implicit knife base model that might help you improve your predictions anyway. Again, ensembles, if you think about um, like bagging or random forests, you have say a hundred decision trees, not just one. Well, if every single tree is an incremental one, then naturally the ensemble is incremental already. You might have to do a little kind of stuff around it, like with bagging, there's this idea that you resample with a replacement, but it turns out that you can actually emulate that quite easily with a Poisson distribution. So what we do now is instead of sampling from all the training set that we don't have, for every single example that comes in, we draw from a Poisson distribution with a mean of one, and that gives us a weight. And that could be zero, which is fine. So this tree will not see this example, or it could be three, then this tree will see three copies of this example. So in the way this kind of emulates bagging quite nicely because the sound distribution is a good approximation of what happens in bagging. Now, neural networks are naturally incremental, but um, unfortunately, usually you have to do a lot of iterations for them to get the good performance. And so this is also an active area of research. Uh, you might still have to do a lot of uh, collecting data upfront and pre-training a good model and then maybe just adapting it a little bit on the actual stream that's coming in. Now, how does all that deal with change? Well, again, it turns out if you do things incrementally, many of those things will slowly adapt to change anyway over time, like uh, the count tables. Yeah, there will be the old counts, but if the new counts are very different from the old ones, eventually the new ones will kind of overshadow the old ones. Now, this kind of because be slow and inefficient, and therefore, usually what you want to do is to be a bit more proactive about change. So you might, instead of having counts, have counts only for a period of time. So you can model it with a sliding window or with exponentially weighted moving averages or something like that. So your counting is smarter and basically only reflects the kind of a more closer past and has a huge discount factors for the distant past. Or you might go a step further. There's something which is called a change detector and there's various algorithms for that. You might actually monitor for change and when you detect it, you might take some drastic actions. And that could mean completely restarting from scratch with your learner, which is maybe not the best idea. Or when you do ensembles, it's easier. You might look at uh, which are the worst trees in my ensemble and I cull them and replace them, grow new trees instead. And to be a little bit more sophisticated, some of those change detectors uh, have two levels of uh, signaling. So they can give you a warning, which kind of means it looks like there might be change, but we're not sure yet. And then, okay, change really has happened. There's a strong statistical support for that to be true. And so you can use it in different ways. A typical way in the ensemble is that when you have a warning, you might start uh, new classifiers, new trees that you not currently use, but you still train them on only the new data because you've just started them. And the, Technical term is often a shadow classifier for that. And then whenever your change detector says, oh yeah, it really is changing, then you take those shadow classifiers and replace the original ones with the newer ones because they've only been trained on the new data. And so you hope that they will perform better on the new data. Okay, now it all looks like there's a lot of uh, things that you have to... Uh, all these troubles that are caused by streams. Now, the nice thing is that they also give you some advantages in terms of um, things that you can do in an online way quite easily and naturally, which is because you have this um, incremental setup where you adapt models incrementally, but you also get some feedback incrementally. You can use that directly to do interesting things like online performance estimation or model selection. So hyperparameter tuning and model selection are two typical things. And I'm really going to rush through that now. I'm going to show you quite a few examples. So I was only mentioning the knife base leaves. When I have a new leaf, the model has only seen a few examples, so it might not be that good. So actually majority decision might be better or not. And again, you have a little counter. You keep count of which of the two is better, and that really works well. I'm not sure, <clears throat> I'm not going to show you any results here, but um, selecting between different models, what you can do if you have 
the power, machine power to do that. You just run <clears throat> a couple of models in parallel and you'll train them in parallel. And you monitor the performance in parallel. And then every time you need to make a prediction, you just use the prediction from the model that you currently think is the best one. So B, last or last, works really well. Um, here's some examples. There's a comparison to some other online methods. Um, the interesting thing here is that the right hand side, the actual accuracy on the problem on average, there's an average around number of data stream problems that we looked at, that was slightly higher than the best of the other methods and almost as good as the theoretical optimum. Because here the oracle is basically, if you would knew which one is the best one, we'll choose that, what accuracy would you get? It was 86% and we were getting pretty close to that. Even though that predicting which was the right one wasn't that well performing only two thirds of the time, whereas the Oracle of course gets it right all the time. Now, I think I might skip this one because that's a little bit too involved, but basically uh, whenever you need to make uh, like for hyper to make a decision, uh, you can use this idea with the online streaming thing. And yeah. I would have a little bit on deep learning as well, but um, the deep learning in the streaming thing is not, the streaming study is not easy because as I said before, you want to do things multiple times. So what you can do is actually, usually have mini batches anyway in deep learning. So you can take a sliding window of your stream and view that as a mini batch and train on that. And that seems to work reasonably well on simple problems. So, yeah, oh. and then when you have those mini batch, you might actually do not just one gradient update, you might do that multiple times. So here, for instance, we see one line where we only do one and then the line where we do three. And of course the three is a little bit better, but eventually they kind of seem to converge to the same values anyway. And the same is true for this other problem and even with 10 updates, which is the gray line. The only advantage the gray line has is my point of view is a little bit smoother, which you would expect from doing more updates, but it's actually more expensive. And again, here in the setting uh, for model selection, what you can do, you can do, you can run multiple uh, networks that use different setups with different optimizers and learning rates and architectures in parallel and always just choose the current best. That seems to work quite well. Um, I'm really running out of time here, aren't I? So, the last thing I would want to mention is that um, it's not exactly the same setup, but you may have heard about this. Uh, in deep learning, there's a subfield called continual learning that becoming very popular. And there's a get together, even smaller subfield of that. It's online continual learning, which becomes very similar to stream mining. And we have done some work on that recently. And um, where we do the similar thing, like we have this mini batch, and we do multiple gradient updates. We're not the only one doing that. But um, what we found is when you do multiple gradient updates and you use augmentation on your data, which is important, then you can get some really nice improvements across the board. So this is across multiple algorithms that can all be modified by adding this repeated gradient updates and augmentation. And in this case, it's really surprising that you get uniform improvements. It always gets better. The amount is different, but you definitely, definitely get improvements that way. So uh, maybe I should really stop here now. There's a lot of things to be done still, and I haven't mentioned that, but there's uh, definitely a few areas that need a lot more work. But it's exciting times, and there's a lot of stuff happening, and there's a lot of opportunity there. And this is like, a mentor that we have here is we want to be open in terms of the software, but also what we should try to be open in terms of data and in terms of models. And of course, there's some issues around uh, open data for various reasons, but I think it st should still be a default if possible. Okay, uh, let's come to an end. I'll just uh, basically have listed a few references of some of the things I was mentioning. Now, I think I should probably really stop. <laughs>